At West Track Belize City, we are looking to help you save both your time and money. We've also improved our stock levels to ensure we have everything you might need for your automotive or agricultural needs. Additionally, West Track has added heavy duty and industrial parts to keep your trucks and equipment running. At West Track Belize City, we understand that your time is important, so we want to bring our services to you at your convenience. Now you can simply send us a message on WhatsApp or Facebook and we will be right there to help with any questions you may have. Whether you're operating a truck, a bus, or sweating it out off-road, Caribbean Tire provides you with a durable tire solution that fits your every need. Triangle. We stand behind our products. Manufactured under tight quality controls, Triangle will keep you rolling. Remember, our team of professionals is dedicated to after-sales services and support. Caribbean Tire, taking you home safely. Fleas and ticks are the worst enemies for dogs and their owners. With NextGuard, you have the weapons to fight effectively. NextGuard is an FDA-approved flea and tick killer in a beef-flavored soft chew. It is manufactured by the same makers of Frontline Plus. NextGuard offers safe and effective protection against flea and tick infestation for at least 30 days. The delicious beef-flavored chew makes it easy to administer to your dog. NextGuard is designed to treat and prevent flea infestations and to treat and control ticks in dogs and puppies 8 weeks of age and older. NextGuard is available in 4 sizes of beef-flavored soft chewables. Each size is color-coded and contains 3 tablets. Available at Rymer's Feed Mill Countrywide. Visit us at your local branch, Rymer's Feed Mill, where growing believes. Did you know? Did you know that your Sagicor advisor can help you plan how to make your golden years your best years? Call a Sagicor agent today. I had a really good time tonight. So did I. Life moves fast. Be prepared with Sagicor. Learn more at sagicorlife.com. Good morning and welcome to Morning Matters. Our guest this morning is a mother, a television broadcaster, and now private consultant, Mrs. Deidre Isaacs Haylock. After growing up and doing her early schooling in Belize, Deidre traveled abroad to obtain a Bachelor's of Science degree in Broadcasting and Public Relations from John Brown University and a Master's degree in Global Political Economy from the University of Sussex. She also gained an NBA certificate from Freeman School of Business at Tulane University. Deidre began her career as a broadcaster and then after her studies, she began working as an executive secretary in the government of Belize. She then moved on to other private sector jobs. You will recall her face from the nightly news as a broadcaster on the main television channels in Belize. She is now one of the principals of Perfect Green. As a private consultant, she offers services in business planning, policy analysis, strategic planning, communications and public relations to several private sectors, government and NGO entities. Deidre, good morning and welcome. Thank you for having me, Rhonda, and congratulations on Morning Matters. Thank you. You know, God's been good to us. Deidre, let's jump right into it. A lot of people think they know who Deidre Isaacs is. They don't. They know what you do. They've seen you on TV. They have an idea of who you are, but truly they don't know who you are. So hopefully this morning we can get a better understanding of who you are and how you have become the woman you are today. So I say thank you for the opportunity to explore this part of your life with us. So let's jump right in. Deidre, where did you grow up? I grew up in Belize City. I'm a true Belize girl. I was born here in Belize City to a single parent home. My mother had four, four of us, two girls and two boys. I'm the third. Most of my siblings do not live here in Belize. They've migrated to the United States. Um, I attended, I lived on the south side of Belize City. I attended Holy Redeemer Primary School. And in my high school, the family moved around a bit. So my first two years are with Polity High School. My third year was in, in San Pedro. So I went to San Pedro High School. And then in my fourth year, um, I encountered a bit of a challenge. 
because um, when I went to San Pedro, I had moved from being a science student to a business student. Uh, they choose their majors in the third year of high school at that time. And so I felt I was repeating science. And so I thought, okay, let me do something different. And my mom agreed to have me change the business. That impacted me on the return because Paloti looked at me and said, but you have one year of science and one year of business. Where would we put you in your fourth year of high school? We would run a risk that you might not make it and you can't repeat fourth year. And St. Catharines didn't want me to just do one year at the high school and get their diploma. So we spent the summer in Cayo with my family there and I enlisted the help of my older aunts to convince my mom that I should stay there to do high school. The principal, Mr. Christopher Eard, was open to it. He did say the responsibility was on me to catch up. And I did and I excelled and graduated from high school. I moved back to Belize City with my mom and I went to St. John's Sixth Form, which it was called at the time, St. John's Junior College. And then I went to work for a year or so at the refugee department here in Belize City. And then I applied for a scholarship. The Walton International Scholarship Program gave me a four year scholarship um, to, to get my bachelor's degree. I transferred so much of my hours from SJC that I completed it in two years. I completed my broadcasting and public relations degree, came back home, worked in the media a bit, worked in public relations at BTL a bit to decide where would my masters be of these two fields. And um, I applied for a Chevening scholarship and won the Chevening scholarship. And my master's degree was at the University of Sussex. And actually I did not do either broadcasting, journalism or public relations. I did what is called global political economy. And um, that's a mix of international politics, international relations, and international trade. You've said a lot, you've done a lot, and you've been to many places. Now let's move through them slowly. Uh, let's start with your mother. You said your mother raised four children on her own. What was that experience like for you? Well, my mother was a teacher, um, and we grew up on the South Side, but the South Side wasn't what we know it as today. In fact, I don't even think we referred to it as South Side back then. Um, it was friendly, it was very neighborly. Um, it was truly a time when neighbors looked out for neighbors um, and neighbors looked out for neighbors' children. So while economically it was challenging, I tend to think that I, have a, I had a happy childhood. I think the experiences and how my mother raised us propelled and shaped who I am. And I think to a certain degree, if you talk to my older siblings, they will say I was a little bit more spoiled because I was allowed to speak my mind more. Um, my mom allowed me to say when I didn't agree with something. It didn't mean that I would get what I want, but she allowed me to say when I didn't agree. And I remember her um, saying to a teacher once when she went to pick up my report card at school, and the teacher said, I have a long list of complaints about Deidre. And she said, she talks too much, she talks too much, she talks too much, she talks too much. And my mom said, I understand, he says, but I will not try to change who she is because maybe her ability to express herself will be how she earns her living in the future. And I'm not going to take that away because I don't know what she will be in the future. Maybe she saw the fact that you might move into broadcasting. You eventually started working in television. Um, when you were growing up, did you like television? And who were some of the broadcasters that, uh, that you found fun? You know, the funny thing, growing up, we didn't even have a television. We would go to the neighbor's house to watch TV. <laughs> so we didn't have a television. We played outdoors a lot. So I can't say that the influence from broadcasting came for that. I think my first introduction to it was at junior college, at SJC, when I met Tanya York. And you know Ed York, her dad, was in charge of Friends FM on BCB at the time. And I used to hang around with Tanya, and she would go to the station to look for her dad. And I can't remember how it came about, but she managed to convince her father for her and I to host a, television, a, a radio um, dance party show. And if I remember right, we called it Teenage Dance Party, it was? And we played music, it was mostly dance hall music and popular music at the time. And we had our radio name. She was T Precious and I was D Unique. And 
that kind of got into my system a bit. And then I mainstreamed into working um, shifts on the radio station. I had a Saturday night shift. I remember that because I couldn't party on Saturday nights. I did not realize what a responsibility I was entering in because my shift started at eight at night and ended at one in the morning. And then the workers van would take me home. But it got in my system and after that, I decided, you know, I will do a course that UWI, at the time was the UWI of School of Continuing Studies. That was the name it went by. And it was a media course that was primarily for persons who were already working in the media. And I guess because we were at Friends FM, doing this teenage dance party show, we got in under the wire, Tanya and I, and we finished it. And so when I applied to do my scholarship and to do my bachelor's degree, that was the course of study I chose. Um, and thereafter, while at school, I worked on the school television station. I anchored, I did weather, I did camera. I did everything that there was in my practicums. And then I worked on the um, radio station that is owned and still owned by the university. So we had to be licensed by the FCC. Uh, we were a non-commercial radio station, but we still had to be licensed. We were still monitored by the FCC and we still had to operate according to the regulations of the FCC. And so I enjoyed that completely. And then I came back home and started out at Channel 5. But before I came back home, I did an internship, well, two. I did one at Love FM, and I was reading news and radio announcer and also working with a multimedia public relations agency that they had at the time. And then in the nights, I would go to Channel 5, and I ran the camera um, on the floor, on the news floor with Channel 5 as an intern. And so when I came back home, Stuart Cohn hired me, and he was my first media, full-time media boss. Um, Ed York and René Villanueva my, were my first media bosses in terms of introducing me to what media was all about. We will get back into that a little bit later on, but you said something that you, you went to the States, you got your degree, and then you started working. Um, what was that whole experience like? I know when you went to San Pedro, that definitely had to have changed your life or shaped your life a little different because you saw so many different things um, as opposed to when you were just going to regular school, which was Palotti. You know, San Pedro is a, is a, is a world of its own. And then you, you, for a short time, you came back and then you went to the States. What was that whole experience like for you again? Um, we, I got, as I mentioned, I got a scholarship that was a Walton International Scholarship Program. It was a scholarship that gave um, education opportunities to, to kids who were from Mexico and Central America. When we went there, um, it was like flying milk because there were so few black-skinned kids on campus. It was a small university by all accounts. There were four, if I recall well, black American students there. The rest of the black kids were from Belize, the Caribbean, and Africa. I encountered a lot of nice people. My experience, it was funny to watch people be uncomfortable and be, be afraid to say the wrong things. And so I just laughed it off. And for me, I think maybe that attitude towards it just, just, just made it pleasurable for me. I milked cows. I gathered eggs in a chicken run. I tried to drive a tractor. I did everything possible to just enjoy where I was because that's where I was and that's where I would be for a time. You then ended up with a Chevron scholarship. How difficult was it for you to attain that scholarship? What was the competition uh, like? That was very competitive. I think I was also a little bit naive, but the thing I remember most was somebody advising me. I can't remember who was saying, you know, you're in the media. Media people don't normally get a Chevening scholar. Chevening scholars are people who are working in NGO and people who are working in government. Rare is it for somebody in the private sector and the media. Hmm. So I said, well, you know something? I will have to let them sit up and take notice of me. However I do it, I'll have to do it. And um, the Honorable Prime Minister at the time now was the um, Deputy Prime Minister. And so I called him one day and I said, listen, this is what I'm trying to do and this is what I want to study. I would like if you can give me a recommendation or a reference that speaks about me, knowing me as a journalist, because that was the sum total he knew me as. I had interviewed him several times. 
um, and gotten to know him that way. And he did. And I guess maybe that made them sit up and take notice of me and probably said, okay, maybe we need to know who this media girl is. Um, if, if the deputy prime minister is giving her a recommendation letter and speaking that way about her, let's see what she is. Um, and I remember in the interview, they asked me, because it was around 1998, um, and it was, part, it was Dr. Barrow that asked me, Dr. Dorian Barrow. He said, well, you have a recommendation letter here from the deputy prime minister. If they win the election, does that mean you have a job? And I said, no. And then he said, well, you're a media person and you have this recommendation letter. It's 1998 and we're in the middle of campaign. Who do you think will win the election? Do you think the UDP will win? And I said, no. I said, they will lose and they will lose very badly. And he said, but how can you say that? This man gave you a letter of recommendation. And I said, that has nothing to do with the fact that his party is going to lose the election and he's going to lose it very badly. As a journalist, we're seeing the climate, we're hearing what people are saying, and they're going to lose. He's not going to be the deputy prime minister come the end of this election. And they did lose. And I, I think... I remember that because I remember having to make myself stand out. I remember the same Dr. Barrow asking me, um, he says, so tell me what, you're gonna go study international politics and international relations. Tell me what you think about the situation between Belize and Guatemala. And I said, the Belize-Guatemala dispute. And he says, it's the Guatemala-Belize dispute. And I said, well, I think that's just the problem. We keep putting Guatemala first when we should be putting us first because we're the ones whose territory is threatened. And maybe if we start thinking about it that way, then our approach is going to be different. So it is the Belize-Guatemala dispute for me. And he said, oh, and I answered his question. And I just went in there with a mindset that I had to differentiate myself somehow to be able to get this scholarship. And those are the things that I tried to do to differentiate myself. We're gonna take a break. When we come back, we'll be coming back with a little bit more of your story. Whether you're operating a truck, a bus, or sweating it out off-road, Caribbean Tire provides you with a durable tire solution that fits your every need. Triangle. We stand behind our products. Manufactured under tight quality controls, Triangle will keep you rolling. Remember, our team of professionals is dedicated to after-sales services and support. Caribbean Tire, taking you home safely. P-TECH has been in Belize now for more than six years. We specialize in residential and industrial high quality glass windows and doors. I'm Melvin Reimer from Discount Auto Sales. I chose P-TECH windows because I'm quite impressed about the way they're manufactured. These are double uh, pane glasses, they're called low E, that keeps out a lot of the heat. Check us out at p-tek.com or give us a call at 671-3842. P-TECH Windows and Doors, a leader in its class. Here at Coop Sheet Metal, we believe our job is very essential in serving our customers. And that is just one reason why visiting us is an experience to be remembered. Here at Coop Sheet Metal, we have a reliable fleet of trucks. We specialize in countrywide delivery of all our material. Coop Sheet Metal is a family business that was started by my grandfather, who even had many of his machines hand-built decades ago to make our products the most reliable in Belize. Come visit us at our new facility on Iguana Creek Road, just past the Belize River leading to Spanish Lookout. Me and my Marie Sharps in Inn Lake. Me and my Marie Sharp in Indiana. I'm in Rodonda Beach, California with my Marie Sharp. Me and my Marie Sharps in Kabul, Afghanistan. Me and my Marie Sharp did a heart for your England. Me and my Marie Sharps in Taipei, Taiwan. Marie Sharp, world-class products produced in Belize. 
I choose Happy Cow Cheese because of its perfect portion sizes and I can travel with it. Because it's nice and soft and creamy and it goes smooth on your bread. I choose Happy Cow Cheese because I eat it with my beans. I eat it with my fried jack. And you know why? Because it's nice. Most of all, when you're on a plane, you know they only give you some crackers and you can just take one out and enjoy it with Happy Cow Cheese. I'm Miss Baker and I choose Happy Cow Cheese because it goes well with all the stuff I bake. Happy Cow Cheese. Look for it in a store near you. Distributed in Belize exclusively by Emilio Ahmad and Sons Limited. I chose Galen because of its strong reputation. Great scholarships. I came because I can take all my classes online. Because Galen University opens doors to the outside world. Their course offering in tourism. It gives me more opportunity to become who I want to be. If you want to connect with your inner champion to make the world a better place, then Galen is right for you. New Buildings Limited is the company of choice when it comes to design, fabricating, and erection of wide-span metal buildings in Belize. At New Buildings, we have a team of well-trained professionals that can produce the most innovative and durable metal structures. Be it domestic or industrial buildings, we can get it done for you. We have put together some of the most outstanding metal structures in the country. We also do estimates and consulting. Visit new buildings in Spanish Lookout or give them a call at 631-8723 or 610-5185. New Buildings Limited, the experts when it comes to metal structures in Belize. Did you know that it's best to keep the lumber stored in a dry place? At KT Enterprises, all our wood is stored in an enclosed space to provide our clients with the highest quality we allow you to personally select your lumber if you choose and we deliver countrywide be it deck board beams and imported hardwood such as red oak and white ash at KT Enterprises we provide you with the highest grade in treated pine construction grade plywood and imported hardwood delivered to your door we continue to build bleeds by reforesting its pine forest visit us today at 2.3 miles to Guana Creek Road or give us a call at 671-0114 or 672-0114. Welcome back to Morning Matters. Mrs. Deidre Isaacs Halock in with us this morning. Mrs. Halock, welcome back. You came back with your master's and then you became the executive director at the Belize Alliance for Conservation. Why there? To be honest with you, there was no thought about taking that job, except that I was dead broke. My thesis was done. I had a master's degree and the expectation is, girl, it's time to work, you know? So I took that job. Um, Ms. Joy Grant, who is now the governor of the Central Bank, was the chairperson of Congo, And um, she was from Program for Belize, and, Program for Belize was one of the four organizations that started Bakongo. It had never had an office up until that point. So I was literally its first staff member. Um, the office was in the attic of the Program for Belize building. And I remember I had to buy every chair, every computer, every filing cabinet, every stitch. I had to figure out how to furnish an office on a Slim Pickens NGO budget. I begged a lot. I got a lot of stiff by begging courts, by begging business persons, by begging alliances. So a lot of the furniture were not bought. They were begged for mm -hmm. and were given to us. But to be honest with you, when I took that job, I had not a single clue what was coming down the wire for that job. I knew it was an advocacy-related organization. I knew there was going to be a lot of communications work. I knew I was going to have to be representing the organization a lot. But I didn't know the heat that would come with having that position because I, I couldn't even fathom the, the issues the organization was taking on. And so as it went along, it was like baptism by fire and it was learning as you went along. Thank God I had a supportive board. I had a supportive chairperson. Ms. Grant was very supportive. I had a supportive second chair who was Ms. Melanie McField. She's now affiliated with Healthy Reef. And I really enjoyed that job despite the heat. One would have expected that you would have come back and continued your, your journalism career. 
why did you not pursue it any further at that time? Um, I went through a bit of searching, uh, trying to determine what I would study in the first place. Um, there were several things I was noticing in the media, although I loved it. Um, I realized that, girl, you ain't going to earn no money doing this thing. And girl, you ain't going to go nowhere doing this thing because Jules is the editor and his daddy owns the station and there ain't no way you're going to unseat him. And then I looked at Love FM and I said, well, René Villanueva is the owner and he has a son that is my age and there ain't no way you're going to aspire for anything there either, child. And then I looked at Channel 5 and I said, okay, Stuart Crone is going to stay there for all it's worth because that's his station and he owns it. So guess what? You ain't going down that road. You have to do something different. Wait. If you want to earn money and make a life and have kids and build a house and all of that good crap. So let me first say, you were wrong about Stuart Crone. He sell the place and gone about the business. <laughs> sell the place. <laughs> But so and, and now somebody else is running the station, so I was wrong there. But it was some years before he saw that thing. <laughs> a long time. But why did you not... Could it be that you were just not passionate about it enough to not go on your own? Because then when you came back, you would have been one of the first people to actually step out on your own and, and to kind of pioneer the way in a different angle, or you just couldn't be bothered with that at that time? No, I think, I think my, my issue was that I was still searching. I was young. I came back home with my master's in 1999. So if you do the math, take 72 from 99, you know how old I was. So I was still young. And um, I wasn't about to take on no loan or I wasn't, I was searching. I wasn't about to anchor into something without having searched around um, for how I wanted to use this knowledge that I had gained and where I saw myself. And I, my sister describes me as the perpetual student, right? That's, that's how she described me once. And I think that maybe that's an apt explanation, whether I'm in formal education or, or outside of formal education, because I always end up going into something where I'm going to learn. So it's, I have this constant searching. And so I didn't see myself at that point locking into something. Um, not that it wasn't an honorable way to go, not that it didn't dawn on me, but I didn't see myself locking into that. I felt that there was a lot more that I needed to learn and particularly to learn about my own country. Um, and so I started pushing myself into little holes that I thought would expose me more. And I would imagine then that why that would be why you have had so many different positions in so many different organizations that would probably reflect you searching and trying to find a place that you are most comfortable and you can be your best self at. So first people would have said, oh, DJ can't hold a job. But when you look at the bottom line, you recognize through this conversation, of course, that you you liked those jobs, you just didn't love them. They did not fulfill your spirit, I would imagine. Now you are on your own. I am. I think while, while, while I had many experiences in terms of agencies I was, um, I was aligned to, every one of the jobs called on my knowledge for communications, my knowledge of working with the media, my knowledge of trying to shape messages. Um, and so when I took out on my own, that's what I ended up doing. And it was highlighted to me um, by a friend. I left government, I came home, and he was talking to me once and he said, so what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I'm going to chill a little bit and then I'm going to try to find something else. And he says, well, you don't need to hurry to find that. He says, you can self-employ. And I said, huh? Because <laughs> it, it didn't dawn on me to do that. And um, he said, yeah, he says, you can do, be a consultant. And I was like, huh? And he said, you do communications, you do marketing, you know the media, um, you know to develop messages to get, a mess, um, to get people's agenda out. He says, so 
you can be a consultant. We're going to get into a little bit more details in that in the third segment, but I want to go back a little. Um, you worked with a lot of NGOs. You also worked with the government. You went from, I think you were working for IDB, and then you went to work for the government. Some would say that, that you left... Uh, or the reverse. So the and then we went to work for IDB. Um, why would you make that switch? Um, when I worked for the NGO, you, you learned very much how the NGO sector works, how the NGO sector operates, what role it plays, and the positive good that it can have in developing the country. The NGOs, their primary stakeholder, their primary adversary many times is the government. How the government makes decisions that impact the people, that impact NGO agenda, NGO development, um, the civil society development. And so I wanted to understand from the government perspective how decisions are made on that other side. I know how NGO make decisions. I know what their premise is that they stand on and what the value is that they play. Now I wanted to appreciate who's this beast that we that I ended up going up against twice for the Solid Ways project and then for the Chaleo Dam. I wanted to understand that. But again, you will find that a lot of um, the way I make decisions, sometimes people say they don't see the logic behind my decisions. I remember when I decided, you know, this heat with the NGO, mm, I'm bored. I'm tired. I really don't need this. The salary ain't that good. I've learned a lot. Now I want to go explore something else. I wrote a letter um, and I sent it out to five different places. Some were private sector and then two were public sector. Bell Trade and the Ministry of Foreign Trade. And this was my letter. There, whoever you are, you know, the name, this is me. If you have a use for me, call me. If you don't have a use for me, stop me in your filing cabinet and call me when you think you do. Literally, that was my letter. I had a job. I wasn't, nobody was chasing me through the doors of Bakongo. So I wasn't pandering for employment. I was exploring. What I was shocked about is that all five persons called back. And all five persons were positive, and all five were on a different development trajectory. And I wasn't naive. When I took the, go the job with government, I knew that the main reason they came gunning for me was because I was the sole voice for Bakongo, and if they took me away, they took away Bakongo's voice. I knew that. And I was like, ah, I see the play here. And so I went for the interview, and it was the most strange interview. And I got the job and I was told that I had to be there by a certain date or don't come at all. So when I got back, I told my chairperson the next day, I said, listen, this is what I saw when I went there. So that EIA, we've been waiting for it to be tabled, is going to be tabled the minute I leave. So please start reading the EIA and please get somebody to be able to advocate and be a voice because I'm going to go. I really am going to go. And I got my contract and I went and it was a different world and it was a different experience and I learned a lot and I enjoyed doing what I was doing. I learned a lot of politics because I started immersing myself into politics a little bit so that I could learn how that beast operates, not just what, how the government operates. In politics, not safe to run, but to try and get closer to the machinery and understand how that machinery works. And so a lot of what I do is, is not motivated by money, or prestige, it's motivated by my own curiosity and wanting to learn. Um, and if it gives me the opportunity to do what I like most, and, and most of that is communication in some shape or form. On that note, we're gonna take a break and be back. Whether you're operating a truck, a bus, or sweating it out off-road, Caribbean Tire provides you with a durable tire solution that fits your every need. Triangle. We stand behind our products. Manufactured under tight quality controls, Triangle will keep you rolling. Remember, 
Our team of professionals is dedicated to after-sales services and support. Caribbean Tire, taking you home safely. P-TECH has been in Belize now for more than six years. We specialize in residential and industrial high-quality glass windows and doors. I'm Melvin Reimer from Discount Auto Sales. I chose P-TECH windows because I'm quite impressed about the way they're manufactured. These are double uh, pane glasses. They're called low E that keeps out a lot of the heat. Check us out at p-tek.com or give us a call at 671-3842. P-TECH windows and doors, a leader in its class. Here at Coop Sheet Metal, we believe our job is very essential in serving our customers. And that is just one reason why visiting us is an experience to be remembered. Here at Coop Sheet Metal, we have a reliable fleet of trucks. We specialize in countrywide delivery of all our material. Coop Sheet Metal is a family business that was started by my grandfather, who even had many of his machines hand-built decades ago to make our products the most reliable in Belize. Come, visit us at our new facility on Iguana Creek Road, just past the Belize River, leading to Spanish Lookout. Me and my Marie Sharps in Inn Lake. Me and my Marie Sharp in Indiana. I'm in Rodonda Beach, California, with my Marie Sharp. Me and my Marie Sharps in Kabul, Afghanistan. Me and my Marie Sharp that are hard for sure, England. Me and my Marie Sharps in Taipei, Taiwan. Marie Sharp, world-class products produced in Belize. I choose Happy Cow Cheese because of its perfect portion sizes and I can travel with it. Because it's nice and soft and creamy and it goes smooth for your bread. I choose Happy Cow Cheese because I eat it with my beans. I eat it with my fried jock. And you know why? Because it's nice. Most of all, when you're on the plane, you know they only give you some crackers and you can just take one out and enjoy it with Happy Cow Cheese. I'm Miss Baker and I choose Happy Cow Cheese because it goes well with all the stuff I bake. Happy Cow Cheese. Look for it in a store near you. Distributed in Belize exclusively by Emilio Ahmad and Sons Limited. I chose Galen because of its strong reputation. Great scholarships. I came because I can take all my classes online. Because Galen University opens doors to the outside world. Their course offering in tourism. It gives me more opportunity to become who I want to be. If you want to connect with your inner champion to make the world a better place, then Galen is right for you. New Buildings Limited is the company of choice when it comes to design, fabricating, and erection of wide-span metal buildings in Belize. At New Buildings, we have a team of well-trained professionals that can produce the most innovative and durable metal structures. Be it domestic or industrial buildings, we can get it done for you. We have put together some of the most outstanding metal structures in the country. We also do estimates and consulting. Visit new buildings in Spanish Lookout or give them a call at 631-8723 or 610-5185. New Buildings Limited, the experts when it comes to metal structures in Belize. Did you know that it's best to keep the lumber stored in a dry place? At KT Enterprises, all our wood is stored in an enclosed space. To provide our clients with the highest quality, we allow you to personally select your lumber if you choose, and we deliver countrywide. Be it deck board, beams, and imported hardwood such as red oak and white ash. At KT Enterprises, we provide you with the highest grade in treated pine, construction grade plywood, and imported hardwood. Delivered to your door. We continue to build Belize by reforesting its pine forest. Visit us today at 2.3 miles Iguana Creek Road or give us a call at 671-0114 or 672-0114. Welcome back to the third and final segment of Morning Matters. Deidre, welcome back. We ended the last segment with the fact that you explored a lot of options. 
But in exploring a lot of those options, at some points in time, you had to have been uh, defending some people. And then the next, ne I would say the next day, but it wasn't literally the next day. The next day you were riding on the train with those people. Some people may say, you know, Deidre, how is it that you can do that? Because that has to do something to your spirit when you are sitting in those rooms. We live in small society, so you have to run into these people. What's that like for you and how do you manage it? Well, I think um, because our market is small, it becomes very emphasized. For example, it happens to media persons. One night they're reporting for Channel 7, the next night they're reporting for Channel 7. Um, if you look over the history of the older reporters, Audrey Matura went through that, myself went through that, Jim went through that a couple of times, Jackie Woods went through that. We all moved from one media house to another. Um, for some of our moves, it was more pronounced because we went TV to TV. Some of us went TV to radio, TV to print, because Anne-Marie moved from Channel 5 to Pulse, right? Um, so we, we do move, and it, it seems pronounced. So in a small market, that's going to be very pronounced. When you watch CNN, NBC, ABC, those reporters move too. You hardly even notice because that market is not our market, number one, and so we don't follow it as closely. And two, their market is huge. And so for some reason, it seems more legitimate. So I, I don't legitimize myself based on that. I, I will say, though, that when I was moving from Bakongo to government, one of the things I did say to, to the government persons was I would not do anything in relation to the, the Chaliyo Dam or the Solid Waste Project or any of those immediate projects that I had just been advocating against because it would have been just a little bit too pronounced and a little bit too hypocritical and a little bit too difficult to, to explain. When I first went to government, I was not doing anything that was communications related. When I started doing work that was communications related was because I kind of stick my foot into something that some people may say, if you had kept quiet, you wouldn't have been drawn in. It was, it was a house meeting and one of the members from the government side was talking about, um, was talking about the Los Lagos project. And he said in response to then the leader of the opposition, who is our prime minister now, that project has become radioactive because of the things you all have said about that project. And I was sitting listening to it and like, somebody who does communications work, somebody who understands that you can overcome a negative image by doing the right things and position things rightly. I wrote a memo to my boss and I said, and the memo was entitled Overcoming the Radioactivity of Los Lagos. I used his words and I gave a list of things that can be done to show people the value of that housing project and to move the housing stock. And I submitted that. And it was that that opened the door for me to start to do communications related type work. Because the memo came back out, not with my boss's signature, but with the prime minister's signature, asking me to go meet with the people at DFC, two of the board members and the then executive director, and talk about how can we better position that project and better promote that project. Government had already built the houses, government investment had already been made, and they needed to be sold. They needed people to live in them. And that's how I started doing communications work as it relates to the government. So when people, that kind of pronounced emphasis, I think is because our market is small. And so I don't let it validate me one way or another. If in my good conscience, uh, I can live with it, then I can live with it. And it really wasn't for the public. My question really was for you. How do you manage it? That, that, was, that was my question. However... As I said, my, my first question was, I would have nothing to do with the projects that I was related with. I would have nothing to say, with the previous, to say about the previous agency that I was related with. 
I, I made that, that line so stiff that when the previous agency came to me and asked me to testify in a court case, I said, I now work for the government. Yes, I work for you. I now work for the government. I will not do that. You have many other people that are as knowledgeable about these projects, as knowledgeable about the issues that the organization is fighting, as knowledgeable about the good um, that they're trying to achieve, you do not need me on a stand to make that case for you in the court. I have left and I would ask you to please draw from that because doing so would put me in conflict, not just with the job I have, but with you as well. And it would not augur well for your case. What drew you into consultancy and how's the market in Belize? Um, what drew me into it really, it was a foreign concept to me. I never, I never thought about that. Uh, um, an in-law, uh, a cousin-in-law brought it to my attention that I was in a position to be able to do that and how I could use my knowledge and my skills to do that. How I approach my consultancy is um, I have a skill, I have a knowledge, and how do I use it to benefit you? One, I try to get to know who you are, how you do what you do, why you do what you do, what is it you're trying to accomplish in doing what you do, and why is that important? And then I sit back and the strategies I write or the advice I give draws from my knowledge and my expertise and from my appreciation of who you are. I am not somebody that will come in and try to change you um, and what you do. What I will try to do is add value to what you do and what you are, you are very, are very good at doing. How do I make you do that better? How do I make you more effectively put that message out there? How do I help you more effectively win support for what you're doing or explain what it is you're doing and the value of what you bring to your market? And that's how I approach my work. Consultancy is fickle. We have um, a, a motto that says feast or famine. There are times when it's very good and there are times when there is no business. So like go COVID, COVID affected consultants drastically because it just slammed on everything. And I came back out from full-time employment to being self-employed just before we um, COVID started being an issue. I, I came back out in the beginning of December. Um, and if you look at the agencies I've served, I've served government, I've served private sector, I've served individuals, I've served um, products, I've served NGOs, and I do communications, I do marketing, and I also do strategic planning. So I, I help particularly civil society organizations um, chart their way forward to get the work that they do. Um, I also do that for government too, because there is one government agency that I did do the strategic plan to, which was the NCT vet, um, uh, and developing a, a strategic plan for the National Council for Technical and Vocational Educational Training. And it's one of the five different clients that I've done that kind of work for. I want you to tell me why should somebody utilize a service like yours? Like what is the benefit of utilizing a service like yours? Well, for me as a consultant, it's not just earning the buck. I do training along with my consultancy work. And I evolved into doing that because I realized that you just come in and you develop a strategy and you say, here's your strategy, that's what you paid me for. And then you walk away, implementation may not happen. And so as a part of any strategy I do, whether it's a strategic plan or whether if it's a communication strategy, I try to do it in a way that I'm training your people on how to do it and how to be prepared to implement it. So that by the time I leave, you're able to pick that ball up and run away with it. Some people have said, well, you the take away business for yourself because if you teach them how to do it, they won't have to come back. That could be true, but in my experience, not necessarily because the same people come back and they ask you, um, my proudest moment is when I walk into a place and I see them using what I, I produce for them as a consultant, or I see them using it in the public domain. One of my clients that immediately comes to my mind, past clients some years ago, was BWS. I had not walked into that office to pay a water bill in a long time. I don't 
necessarily am the part of the, the family member that pays the water bill or goes to pay the bills. So I went there for a different purpose. And I walked into the lobby and I was like, wow. Because I remember when I was there, I talked about branding and I talked to them about understanding the very simple things as to what exactly is, is that shade of blue they use and that shade of orange they use. What are their motto? What are their principles? What are their, what is their ethics? What is their vision statement, their mission statement? And I walked in and the branding was so strong in the office, in the common area. They had painted it and learned the right shade of blue that they had, the right shade of orange they had, and they had their principles painted on the walls. And then I didn't get to go into their boardroom, but my husband did for a different meeting. And it was all around them. And I said, you need to be proud of what your vision and your mission is. You need to let it be seen in your workplace. You need to let your employees understand that so that they can be ambassadors for you. And the, one of the most visible ways to do it is to surround the workspace with it, that they see it, they're reminded of it every day. And to, to, he took pictures of it on their wall that they have it in their boardroom. And I was like, wow. And the day when I was there, one of the employees came down the stairs. She is mid-level management. And I looked at it and I said to her, oh my gosh, this, this gives me goosebumps. And she says, you know, we still use that strategy that you gave us. We still refer to that. And we still let that guide us in a lot of what we do for communications internally and externally. And for me, that's an accomplishment. You've been in and out of the media, and I don't want to stay there, but I feel that you have, you are very vocal where that is concerned. Do you think that there is such thing as independent media in the league? Um, I think, I think our media practitioners try. When you work for the media as a journalist, you got to be very strong to defend the story and the angles that you want to report it from. Mm. A lot of our media houses are aligned to families that are politically aligned or aligned to ownership that is politically aligned um, or management may be politically aligned. And so that colors things a whole lot. It's not any different from when I was there. It is the same now and some may say even more pronounced. Um, I think the practitioners, the people who, the journalists, the reporters, they're the ones that have to set the standards for themselves. They're the ones that have to set the ethics for themselves because there's none of that here for the industry. And they've got to be strong and stand for something or they'll fall for anything. But and I see may, them trying to do that. Sorry, but one may say that the same way the bosses or the supervisors or the owner have an agenda, it could be that the persons that deem themselves as journalists have their own agenda. So there mm -hmm. has to be some balance. So I go back to say again, is there anything as independent media in your mind? Well, we're humans, right? And so once we're involved in it, it's gonna color the agenda or the mindset that we have. We can only try to be objective and only try to remember that there, there are more sides than the side that we see and try to represent that. When I train public officers or I train public officials or I train executives on how to work with the media, I tell them, you have an agenda and they have an agenda. Consume the media. Understand what each and every reporter agenda is and each and every media house agenda is. Remember, it's your agenda you're selling, it's your stage. You do not need to answer any question the media presents to you the way they expect you to. You have your key messages and you answer it the way you want to expect it. They may come armed with that microphone and that camera, and it may be intimidating, but they don't know your issue. They are asking you the questions because they don't know, you do. So sell yourself and maintain your stage and control your environment. In 1998, you predicted the elections. What are your predictions now? Oh my gosh. I think I was a little bit bolder in my younger years in 1998. 
And while this may sound like a cop out in this kind of a public forum, I would not want to hazard a prediction. I will say though, that both political parties are particularly bedeviled right now with differentiating themselves. And they both have their own Achilles heel that they themselves have in, has inflicted that injury on themselves. And so the winner will be the person that is able to convince that they stand for something different, that they've learned lessons of the past, and that even though the faces may be the same, the commitment to change is there. And I do say that both sides are struggling and grappling with being able to sell that pill. And if you were to judge based on your experience, who would you think have done the better job so far in that direction? Girl, I would say there is no clear winner. Because right now the UDP is grappling with a, with a leadership question. And so it's kind of hard to judge what the UDP will be by looking at the current leader because he's on his way out. Um, and to be fair to any new leader, you'd want to say that that person is serving right now under a political, under a political philosophy and a political tide and may well step out differently from that if they were where had the crown on their head. Um, but until that question is answered and you start seeing who that person is and you start seeing how they step, for right now it's just all balls in the air for them and what their future holds and how people will view them. I think um, a lot of baggage or lack of baggage or no baggage will come based on who that person is. For the PUP, they grapple with, with that because the names are the same and the faces are the same. And people have grown very skeptical. People have grown to mistrust. And people have grown to say, well, make a seat first because I know they believe just where you sit. Deidre? Still very much vote out rather than vote in. So we will see with time when this election comes closer, perhaps we can sit down again and have another, direct, uh, another conversation. Please, before you go, tell us how people can contact you to get your service. Well, I am on Facebook in my own person. I am also on Facebook as Perfect Green Belize, P-R-F-E-C-T, Green Belize. And uh, my telephone number, um, if you visit my, my Facebook pages, you will see that. We also have a website that we're trying to develop and trying to officialize, which is www.perfectgreenbze.com. So P-R-F-E-C-T green B-Z-E.com. And that's how they can get in touch with me. Deidre, thank you for stopping and sharing with us this morning. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. And thanks and continued good um, fortunes with Morning Matters. Thank you so much.